Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Sabrina Devone, and I will be the moderator for today's webinar. I am a member of the Business Transformation and Innovation Organization at FLOOR. We focus on new and innovative ideas, never losing sight of the critical thinking and analysis that comes from our global team of experts and designers. Our people are at the core of our success. Everyone on the Innovation Builders team and the speakers on this call are remote working parents and grandparents, and we applaud their ability to find time to share their knowledge in addition to serving their clients while juggling the intersection of their career and home lives. Today's technical presentation is intended mainly for process engineers who are interested in knowing more about how we use advanced process modeling for troubleshooting. Our speaker today will be Michael Ettinger. Michael is a chemical engineer with over 15 years of experience from Flores Aliso Viejo office. Out of college, he worked in both a chemical plant and a manufacturing facility. Since joining Floor 13 years ago, he's been working on refining projects and occasionally specialty studies, such as process modeling for the production of kettle chips that he is here to talk about today. But before we get into the presentation, a couple of housekeeping items. The audio lines for attendees have all been muted to eliminate background noise. The session today is being recorded and will be stored in the United States. Please make use of the Q&A tab to ask any questions, which should be addressed to all panelists. We invite dialogue and we'll pause about halfway through and again at the end to address any questions that come through the Q&A. We value your time and the webinar will not extend past the allotted hour. If Michael is not able to answer all questions during this session, a Q&A summary will be sent to all participants within a few days. The floor has a very strong safety-driven culture, so it is customary for us to start our meetings with a brief safety topic, which Michael will present. So Michael, please unmute your audio and begin. Thank you, Sabrina. So our safety topic is about the hazards of deep frying with oil. It's relevant to our discussion and many hazards apply across deep frying at home in a restaurant or in manufacturing. So uh, first, high temperatures represent a burn hazard for skin exposure since deep frying temperatures can reach over 400 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, oils have a smoke point that they reach before a boiling point. And at the smoke point, the fat starts to thermally degrade producing smoke and hazardous byproducts. And some oils have lower smoke points. For example, extra virgin olive oil has a smoke point at 320F, so could be hazardous for deep frying. Oil has to be hot enough to safely cook foods like chicken when you deep fry. Um, a common home deep frying application is Thanksgiving turkey. And when you fry large foods like a whole turkey, you have to make sure you leave room for the turkey so you don't spill hot oil. Uh, turning off the fryer. If you don't remember to turn off your fryer, you may not notice the oil still hot since it's not actively frying and bubbling. And if you're going to reuse oil, then there's steps you have to take for preserving the oil, such as straining out the food bits with the cheesecloth and storing it in your refrigerator. But even then, there's a shelf life, so you have to check your reused oil before you use it to make sure it hasn't gone rancid. And disposing of oil should be done in the trash or at a disposal facility as it can harden in your pipes if it cools or once it cools if you pour it down the sink. And then there's health problems we all know about if we eat too much fatty foods, so we should practice moderation. So for our agenda, first, we're going to go over some general background on chip frying and introduce the fryer modeling study we did. And next, we'll walk through the model we developed for the fryer, discussing the objectives, the fryer evaporation model, and the overall fryer system simulation. And then we'll discuss the evaluations uh, that were done for the study and the study results. So first, just some brief background. I want to mention the difference between continuous chip fryers and uh, the kettle potato chip process. Continuous chip fryers continuously feed 
as they're moved along the fryer. Uh, there's many different designs for continuous chip fryers, and they're used not just for chips, but many potato products like fries and sticks and so on. Some of the advantage of, advantages of continuous fryers are high production capacity, tight temperature control, adjustable oil circulation, and oil filtration, which means less cleaning. Uh, kettle potato chips are characteristically crispier and sometimes thicker slices. And kettle frying is traditionally a batch-wise process. So you start with hot oil and then chip slices are added. And the temperature initially drops as water from the chip is evaporated. And then the temperature rises again as heat is continuously supplied. So over the course of the batch, you get this inverted bell temperature profile. And this is critical to producing the hard crunch kettle bite. So while you need a batch process to produce certain kettle chip qualities, it limits production capacity compared to a continuous fryer. Uh, we had a client that was implementing a continuous fryer to produce a kettle-like chip, and this was going to be a continuous process instead of a batch process. So it gives the advantages of high capacity and tight control. And using multiple discrete zones in the fryer with oil feed and with draw points, the continuous fryer can somewhat mimic the kettle inverted bell temperature profile. However, the profile is still different from batch fryer and it results in a unique chip quality that the client was actually going for. So next uh, we'll bring up a simplified overall system sketch for the continuous fryer. And first, uh, Chips are fed to the first zone from an upstream slicer, and that that first zone has a has a controlled temperature of the oil coming in. A steam heater is used to set the oil, the hot oil makeup temperatures to each zone, and the first zone has a cooler to adjust the zone inlet temperature. Subsequent zones can control the amount of oil withdrawn to meet zone inlet temperatures uh, when they mix with hot oil going into the next zone. And a main oil pump is used to circulate the heated oil. Makeup oil is added uh, to maintain the amount of oil in the system uh, as the chips will uptake some of the oil. And then there's filtration steps uh, included to remove chip fines. And finally, uh, chip products go to the next stage uh, for sorting, having been fried to achieve the target moisture and oil content. The oil on the chip continues to absorb while the chip cools. Uh, now let's talk more about the objectives and drivers for the study. So the situation for our study was that the new fryer had already been specified, purchased, and was under construction. And the client had a material balance um, that was based on one set of recipe values, but they needed to have a model of the system. And their drivers for creating a model included identifying any potential limitations to the equipment design uh, for their proposed operation, also verifying the adequacy of the fryer equipment, and not just for the main recipe values, but for a range of operating conditions, and predicting outcome to changes in the chip feed rate, moisture content, um, chip residence time, recipe uh, values for, for oil flow, and then also being able to tune the operation during the initial startup, and then once they're going, being able to tune the model to uh, better match the operation. So in essence, uh, you know, in the long run, they want to create a digital twin uh, of, the, of the fryer system in the future for evaluating uh, future optimizations. So the client needed us to develop a, a model or simulation for the fryer. And Floor has a lot of process simulation experience and simulators are used in a variety of energy and chemical processes. And this is where a lot of my background is. A chip fryer is different though than typical process simulator applications. So while some of the components of the system are common to simulators such as pumps and exchangers, the fryer itself presents some unique challenges. 
frying process is actually quite complex. You have heat transfer from the hot oil to the chip, desorption of water from the potato, evaporation of the water, and then diffusion of the steam out of the potato. So you have to find a way to simplify the model while being able to accurately match real data. And then another challenge is how do you model components that are not comprised of discrete compounds? Oils are mostly triglycerides and fatty acid, and many of which are not available in simulators um, as out of the box components, and then potatoes or starch. So a continuous stirred tank reactor or CSTR is used to model the fryer. A CSTR is a classic reactor type in chemical engineering. And the core assumption of a CSTR is that it is a well-mixed uh, system. So it homo has a homogeneous temperature and concentration. Since the heat transfer from the oil to the chip is very fast, this is a good assumption. Um, in the simulator, the chips themselves can actually kind of act as a CSTR. And what I mean by that is that the potato slice can be moved through the process as a component um, with the heat transferred from the oil and the water evaporation from inside the potato. And then the potatoes as a stream don't have to be mixed with the circulating oil stream. Um, but in order to capture the temperature profile of the chip as it moves through the fryer zone, we have to break up each zone into multiple CSTRs in series. The performance of the CSTR, and by that I mean the water evaporation, moisture profile, and temperature profile, then are estimated using chemical reaction kinetic models and the residence time in the CSTR. The residence time is just how fast the chips are moving through each zone, which is set by the paddle speed. And I'll talk more about the evaporation kinetics in a minute. So now I'm going to bring up a diagram just to illustrate what I just described. The potato slice comes in with its moisture uh, that is then evaporated by heat from the oil. And the amount, the amount of heat transferred is, is set to match the potato temperature, um, which in turn is estimated from the evaporation determined by the, by the kinetic model. Um, with each zone broken into multiple subzones or CSTRs in series, you can use as many zones as necessary to get a reasonable temperature profile across the fryer. So next I'll uh, bring up the, the reaction network that's used for the kinetic model. And this is, this is really the, the heart of the model. Um, the network of re evaporation reactions considers fast and slow reactions with different order kinetics and rate constants. And so while this is an empirical approach because it's determining a rate of evaporation, which is dependent on multiple processes, it's doing it just through the reaction kinetics. This type of model has been evaluated as a, as a good fit for evaporation behavior in previous research. So it was uh, applied in, in this case as, as the best fit. Multiple water components are defined to facilitate a reaction of what we're calling bound water, which is the incoming chip moisture, uh, to evaporated steam. Each bound water type has a minimum concentration in the model that the evaporation reaction will asymptotically approach. And these are the uh, WB10 to WB30 parameters. Um, the kinetics use a reference temperature to set the basis of temperature dependence on reaction rate. And these are the K10 to K50 parameters, which are the rate constants at the reference temperature, which is T0. We regressed multiple sets of plant data to set values for the parameters in the evaporation kinetic model. And working with the client, these kettle batch data sets were deemed appropriate for establishing the rate parameters. And the model fits the data quite well. Um, a point that I want to emphasize here is the importance of good data. A lot of, a lot of uh, work goes into qualifying the data to make sure that it's representative of your process. And if you have bad data that you're basing your model on, it goes back to the old adage of junk in and junk out, meaning your model is not going to be accurate. Uh, with without good data. So next, uh, I'll bring up a diagram that is basically to give an idea of how the Fryer model is implemented in the simulation. 
the evaporation kinetics are are run as a subroutine in the CSTR and the heat as noted by Q supplied from the oil to the reactor is adjusted to give the equal outlet temperatures of the oil and the chips. As I mentioned, multiple CSTRs were used and uh, four was found to give a reasonable approximation of the uh, temperature profile. Um, so as I mentioned, regression of plant data was used to establish the evaporation kinetic parameters. And it was done using uh, batch operation data from uh, a kettle fryer. Uh, but in the continuous fryer, the chips undergo a more torturous path due to forward and reverse mixing paddles. Uh, the client had observed during test runs with similar fryer configurations that the continuous fryer can achieve the target moisture content with a shorter residence time. So to capture this effect, we built in a time compression parameter in the kinetics that lets you use the rate parameters data ob obtained from uh, the batch fryers, but speeds up the evaporation to match the performance of the continuous fryer. So aside from the fryer, another challenge is uh, characterizing a potato and sunflower oil in a simulation. Um, when we model atypical components, we have to focus on uh, finding a way to accurately model the most important properties so that the model will reflect reality. In this case, potato heat capacity, oil heat capacity, and oil transport properties are what we need to work with our fryer model and evaluate the fryer system equipment. Oil and potato chip properties were defined using regressed parameters to match literature data for the key properties. Um, and then bound water, which is the incoming moisture in the potato, is defined as a separate component. The energetics of water are preserved as we start from a water component uh, in the simulator database, but we modify the vapor pressure so that it will always stay with the chip until it's converted by reaction. And water vapor is also defined starting from water, but it has its interaction parameters adjusted to make it highly non-ideal with the chip so that once it is converted by reaction from bound water, it'll leave the system as water vapor. So now that the fryer model is established, we can move on to evaluating the fryer system as a whole. Uh, the starting point for the simulation was the previously established heat and material balance that sets all of the oil flow rates and zone temperatures as what I'm calling recipe values, including uh, zone temperatures, oil flow rates, and zone residence times. However, they're not all independent once you actually have a model because, for example, once the oil flow rate, chip feed rate, and residence time are set, the zone outlet temperature is going to be a fixed condition determined by the fryer model. So we had to establish a hierarchy of the most critical recipe values for chip quality uh, working with the client. And so these were the zone one inlet and outlet temperatures, which is set by controlling the zone one oil inlet temperature and flow rate, and then the subsequent zone outlet temperatures were critical. And these are set by controlling the hot oil feed rate to each zone. And setting the, the zone temperature profiles in this way ensures they get a characteristic temp that you get a characteristic temperature profile that gives the desired chip quality. So I'll just bring up the system sketch again so that it's clear how the uh, zone temperatures are controlled. So we're meeting the zone one inlet and outlet temperatures by the inlet oil flow rate and temperature, which uses hot oil mixed with cooled oil from the zone one draw. And then subsequent zones are met uh, by using the, the flow of hot oil that gives the target zone outlet temperature. So now I'll talk about the uh, cases that were 
that were uh, used to structure our study. So together with the client, we established different steady state operating scenarios that they wanted to evaluate. The normal operation, which I'm showing here as case one, is with the normal potato feed rate, moisture, and chip residence time. And then other cases consider perturbations for the feed rate, residence time, and incoming moisture. And in all the cases, the critical recipe values for the temperature profile are met. And this let us look at whether equipment was adequate to handle the range of operating conditions, whether control valves would be in nice controllable positions, and how the oil flows that are required for that temperature profile vary from case to case. So with the more unique features of the Fryer system established, the evaporation model and the uh, atypical component characterization, the equipment can now be modeled by the more conventional simulator functions. The main oil pump is a centrifugal pump with a variable frequency drive. And we built in the pump curve in the simulation along with detailed pump hydraulics to determine the required pump speed. And the zone outlet pumps are positive displacement pumps with a variable frequency drive for capacity control. And we set the zone one outlet flow rate to ensure that the control valves are, are all in a workable operating range. Other zone outlet pumps were set to match the original recipe values. And the steam heat exchanger was modeled rigorously in the simulation so that its performance under different operating scenarios is accurately captured. The oil cooler likewise was modeled rigorously in the simulation. And so for the oil cooler and the steam heater, what I mean by uh, rigorous modeling is we build the, the geometry into the simulation so that um, we can uh, you know, use exchanger rating programs to predict the performance. Control valve characteristics were implemented in the simulation to evaluate the control valve travel. And the cyclone and catch box were not modeled since uh, there was no data available, and so they were just check rated at a high level by comparing capacity. However, we included provisions in the simulations that the client uh, could specify chip losses from the fryer later. Uh, so before we proceed to talk about the study results, let's take a look to see if we have any questions or comments. Thanks, Michael. Yes, we do have a couple of questions for you. So does the geometry of the kettle chip matter to the heat transfer process? Yeah, I mean, yeah, geometry of a, of a chip is, um, it definitely matters for heat transfer if you think about having a, uh, a thicker chip or a thinner chip. Um, one of the uh, good things about having a model like this though is that it, it's, it's capturing those effects um, through through evaporation kinetics that that can be tuned. So, um, if you're if you're looking to fry a chip with a different geometry, then uh, using plant data, you can go back to the uh, you know plant data regression to to tune your model accordingly. Thank you. Another question: Are the potato is the potato feed stream always uniform and um, if not, how are the feed differences incorporated? Yeah, uh, yeah. So potato feed is is uh, I, I would say somewhat uniform. It it is a it's a potato. It's a it's a uh, it's a vegetable. So it has variation, and that's um, you know one of the uh, drivers for looking at perturbation scenarios to evaluate the difference in, in how the fryer system has to uh, perform to adjust. Okay, but well, we'll pause questions for now. Uh, to our audience, please keep typing in your questions in the Q&A panel and address it to all panelists. And we will leave ample time at the end to address more questions. So Michael, please continue. Yeah, thank you, Sabrina. So let's talk about the study results now. 
this is the base case uh, or case one to show how the temperature profile and moisture profiles look. Uh, the temperature profile uh, has the most dramatic drop in the first zone where the evaporation is higher because there's more loosely bound water and you're further away from the minimum moisture limits where the evaporation asymptotically declines. Um, and later zones have less dramatic temperature drops since there's less evaporation occurring for the same reasons. The outlet moisture content is an important parameter uh, for chip quality, but we don't actually use it as a recipe value in, in the study because it's inherently met by the other recipe values in residence time. The first level of conclusions from the study are at the heat and material balance level and differences that we find uh, with lower level recipe values. It's hard to say what drives differences with the original recipe without knowing the, the background on the original heat and material balance. So I can only speak to the results of our study, but here are some of the conclusions from the, the heat and material balances. So first, um, by hitting the critical recipe values of zone temperatures, we identified how the oil flow rates would differ. Um, the most significant difference was in the zone one inlet oil rate. The final moisture content in cases one to three uh, were approximately equal because we're matching zone residence times and feed moisture profile, or sorry, feed moisture and temperature profiles. Um, and so the, the oil flow rate then just changes accordingly for case two and three where um, you have different chip feed rates. And the final moisture content in cases four to seven um, are would 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 change with uh, the moisture being higher with less feed solids or more moisture and uh, higher with less residence time. Um, and then a, a, an important observation I want to identify here is that uh, increasing the zone one outlet flow actually decreases the steam heater duty. Initially, this could be a little counterintuitive because you think more cooling uh, means the heat balance will also need more heating. However, uh, the zone one has a fixed inlet oil temperature and flow rate to meet the target outlet temperature. So if you use more of the zone one outlet oil uh, for making up that inlet oil stream, then you're using less hot oil and you just need to bypass more of the oil cooler to still meet that uh, target inlet temperature. So the way we set the zone one oil draw rate was to keep the system in a controllable range on the heating and cooling medium control valves. The next level of conclusions is on potential equipment deficiencies in the main case one. The main oil pump was short on head in at the maximum speed. Uh, so analyzing the hydraulics, the driver for this was a uh, high pressure drop in, across the steam heater. The steam heater had excessive pressure drop and was designed with multiple tube passes. We identified a simple modification to the channel pass configuration that could be done to debottleneck the main oil pump. And an alternate operation adjustment that was identified was to increase the zone one outlet flow rate while minimizing the cooling of the zone one outlet oil so that you can reduce the total uh, hot oil requirement to zone one and in turn the total hot oil demand through the steam heater. This wasn't done in the heat and material balance since it was going to set some of the, con the control valves around the cooler at excessive travel, but it was explored as an option on behalf of the client. Um, so now to talk about the uh, identification of equipment limitations for the perturbation cases. Uh, all of the cases uh, exhibited the main oil pump head shortfall, except for uh, reduced chip feed rate. Decreases, de decreases in chip feed moisture and increase in chip solids resulted in a higher product mass rate. Um, which is a conclusion to be considered for the downstream uh, systems and impact on their capacity. 
And I'm going to bring up the system sketch on the next slide so I can summarize uh, these findings at a, at a picture level and then also go over some additional insights gleaned from the study. So just running through some of the results. First, like I mentioned, the main oil pump was capacity limited. Primarily due to the pressure drop of the steam heater and uh, cost effective solutions were proposed, including modifying. The exchanger, the, the steam heater exchanger channel. In terms of other equipment modifications, other alternatives such as reducing other hydraulic losses in the system would have been less cost effective with limited benefit and increasing the pump differential pressure uh, faced issues of system design pressure limits. Uh, the second conclusion is uh, impacts to the final product rate and properties were identified for the different perturbations or the perturbation cases. And uh, so that these could be considered in checking the impact on downstream systems. And now to move on to some additional insights, we identified capacity limitations in the steam supply due to line and control valve size. And through the model, we were able to provide estimates of the minimum zone one outlet oil draw to uh, avoid steam supply constraints um, since decreasing the zone one outlet oil ramps up the required hot oil flows we discussed. Another uh, insight was we identified the benefit of increasing the zone one oil draw pump capacity to reduce the hot oil demand and evaluated potential pump revamp options that could be further pursued in the future. We identified issues with the cooling system controllability. The cooling system had excessive capacity and so necessitated a large portion of uh, cooler bypass through the three-way control valve that's used for temperature control. Um, cooling water operating temperatures and alternate cooling system control valve configurations were analyzed to optimize the controllability. Some of these are, uh, you know, additional capital to change the configuration. So they were evaluated on behalf of the client. Um, we identified potential alternate operating modes where you could operate without the oil cooler. The first option there would be to increase the zone one outlet oil draw rate high enough that you wouldn't need the oil cooler. But this alone uh, exceeded the zone one outlet pump capacity. Um, however, using unheated oil by bypassing the steam heater would allow for operating the zone one outlet oil pump within its existing capacity limits um, while eliminating the need for cooling. What I was saying there with the one option was uh, to increase the, the zone one outlet draw. And then another option was identified was uh, a bypass around the, the steam heater. And then lastly, we identified uh, some specific areas where they could benefit from additional instrumentation. So what were the benefits for the client from this study? Uh, we provided them with a tool that could be used to predict system performance. Uh, the study helped understand how oil flow rates and operating parameters need to be adjusted to meet the key recipe values under different changes to the feed and operation. Uh, the study provided insight to system limitations for different operating scenarios. Uh, and by system limitations, we're talking about the, you know, uh, a, a pump head shortfall and so forth under different scenarios. And these aided the client in uh, startup troubleshooting. And then we identified modifications and alternate operating schemes that they could consider to optimize the system. And perhaps most importantly, the model can be improved and it can be tuned using plant data for better prediction of the system performance. 
one of the ways to do this is obviously adapting plant data to update the, the kinetic parameter regression for different operating scenarios. And additionally, we implemented ways in the simulation that they could account for other empirical effects, including heat loss from the fryer, um, back mixing at all the oil drop points, and back mixing is where the uh, the the inlet oil to the next zone partially gets pulled out in the previous zone withdrawal. And and we uh, implemented a way they could account for loss of chip finds from the filtering points in the system. So in summary, we took a complex process and using data along with a suitable way to treat the problem, uh, we were able to create a valuable model uh, from our, for our client using our technical expertise and at the same time using our engineering know-how to find and address potential issues. And if you think you have the, the right, if you're sorry, if you have the right data and you can apply it correctly, it opens up the world of problems you can solve. Uh, so thank you again uh, for your time this morning. And before we go, Sabrina, do we have uh, any other questions coming in? Thanks, Mike. Yes, we do. But first, I'm curious. Did you get to try the chips? Uh, no, I did not. Thanks for asking. <laughs> I think that should be part of the deal. So. All right, our first question, uh, how important is the accuracy of temperature control? Yeah, temperature control is uh, critical. Um, like we were talking about in the beginning with the batch kettle chip process, the, the characteristic temperature profile is what gives, um, is one of the, the key features that gives the chip its characteristic bite, um, which is uh, you know, a big factor in what you think of of one chip versus another, um, so the control and the temperature profile, um, final moisture content. I mean, these are all uh, super key to the 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 characteristic qualities of a chip. All right, a question from a floor fellow, Harry Ha. How would you validate your three bond water content in the chips, and is there any lab data to define them? Yeah, so without getting into um, too much detail on uh, how how each of them are set, you know, because the moisture content coming in with the chip has it has a, a fixed moisture value, and then each uh, that moisture has to be broken up between the uh, different um, bound water uh, types, and uh, so. Setting those is was a uh, combination of working with the client, but um, more so in validating the model against the plant data that the the model is fitted to. So, did the finished plant match the uh, simulation model? Yeah, unfortunately, I don't have a a lot of uh, feedback uh, on that because um, you know I didn't get a uh, you know a, another chunk of data to to go back and look at the model again but um this is actually the nature of doing a lot of projects right if they if they go well then uh, you might get some positive feedback but you may not get uh you know a lot of um plant data because that's um basically coming back to do uh additional work if the job was done well a lot of times you don't you don't hear anything um we did get some very positive feedback uh, from the client in terms of um, how uh, you know well the model uh, worked in terms of aiding in their startup troubleshooting and um, and their uh, appreciation of the uh, technical expertise that went into developing it and the tool it gave them. That sounds good. So did you include a dynamic analysis in your study? No, the uh, so the dynamic analysis was um, something the client was was initially interested in 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 um, uh, moving on to the next phase after doing the steady state, um, and so that was uh, 
discussed uh, how we would go about doing that. Um, and so, yeah, it was it was on the table. It was discussed and we had uh, started looking into it. Um, but we this the study did the study scope did not include uh, a dynamic simulation. OK, and along those lines, how much batch plant data is necessary to develop the kinetic model? Or to develop um, the model in general? Yeah, yeah. so that that's that's a, a problem that is uh, tackled uh, with the client. I, I can say, you know, for us, we we looked at uh, many different um, batch runs of, uh, as I said, we use the, the kettle batch data to fit the model. Um, the, the regression uh, slide I showed basically kind of showed like two uh, sets of data points against the um, predicted moisture profile, but uh, a lot more than that went into it. And, and as I was saying during the presentation, it, it also goes into qualifying the data and, uh, you know, figuring out with the client, what is the, the best data sets to use? What's the most representative? Were there any issues with the data? Is there any key differences that make the data non applicable? Um, so it was, it was many more than two, uh, definitely. And so that was a, a big topic at the beginning of the, the study. I understand how that could be very necessary. All right, another question. What are the advantages of using steam versus a hot oil heater? Um, well, you know, speaking in general, uh, a lot of times what the difference between a hot oil heater and steam is, is what temperature you need to get your oil to. Um, and, you know, so if, if you're, if, if you're, uh, if your if your supply temperature is is above the steam supply available, um, then then uh, then that's going to push you to a hot oil heater. Another issue, though, I think for um, a fryer system is if you have a uh, you know a leak in your exchanger, then um, clean steam is is going to be less of a hazard than than a hot oil in terms of uh, you know contamination and cleaning the system and so forth um, as I mentioned the the basis of the study or the starting point of the study was that we had a fryer system that or sorry there was a fryer system from the client that had already been uh, specified and was nearing the completion of construction so um, you know, every project is different in terms of uh, when we come in, what our scope is. And uh, so in this case, the steam heater was already specified, but for the, the reasons I mentioned, um, steam was the appropriate heat medium. Thank you. Uh, so how did you determine the number of ST CFTRs to model? And are there any advantages or disadvantages to more or less? So there's a disadvantage to going to less. And um, there's uh, diminishing value in going to more at some point. Um, and uh, so you want to get to a point where you have enough to um, to give a representative uh, temperature profile because you know it is a continuous fryer in essence it is it is it is not a cstr but the cstr is the model is the tool that we're using to to do it so you're you're using multiple cstrs to approximate the you know the, the forward plug flow that that's actually happening so um yeah going less there there is an issue but going more um, there's no issue with going more, but at some point you don't need to go more. Okay. So where utility costs are a concern to the client, was this used to optimize the performance? So let me let me just get this. So were utility costs 
It, say, I'm sorry, Sabrina, say that one more time. Where utility costs are a concern to the client. So was, was this used to optimize the performance of utilities? No, yeah, this was this was not used to optimize the performance of utilities. Um, however, one of the uh, charters of the study was to um, was to look at the the controllability and general optimizations. So, once we had the the Fryer model and we understood the system well, and we had looked at multiple perturbation cases that we were at a point to offer a lot of additional insights. Um, it, when we were going through the you know, additional insights that we gleaned from the study, uh, we, we, did inc we did have a lot of uh, you know, utility optimization. Um, and a lot of that was focused on the, uh, you know, the zone one um, temperature control, so kind of uh, along the lines of the two conclusions I showed where we had looked at um, an alternate scheme of bypassing the steam heater plus drawing more outlet oil from the outlet of zone one. And um, so those those alternate operating modes uh, would optimize the energy efficiency. But in the end, yeah, the temperature profile is 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 king. So the no matter what, you're always um, you know running the system in order to meet the uh, the temperature profile. Okay. So in researching this project, uh, as you stated earlier, that kettle chips have are distinct from other types of chips. Uh, so do the client chips, do you think the recipes are generally the same or are there significant differences in the recipes? Um, yeah, that's hard, uh, a little hard for me to say because um, without, I'm, I'm not a uh, person from the chip industry, but I, I guess that's an example, I guess, of how uh, advanced process modeling can, can be applied with the expertise and know-how to situations you're not usually accustomed to um the the chips that we were stud or the chip fryer that we were studying was for a quote unquote kettle like chip so it was producing unique qualities different from a a kettle chip uh and that was actually what they were going for and the continuous fryer obviously offered them additional benefits um but with that said, the exact you know what you think of as as, as a bag of of kettle chips are traditionally done um, in a batch fryer, and it's so with the batch fryer you've got you've got a vat of oil and you're controlling the temperature, but there's not you know per se a recipe value in terms of the oil because it's a batch process and your chips are you know submerged in the oil the entire time. Um, whereas with a continuous fryer, the uh, the oil flow rate is another variable now that that you know we uh, were referring to as recipe values. There, I hope that answers the question. That was great, thank you. So, is there any reason that the model was developed after the plant design construction started? Um. Yeah, I mean, I think ideally most projects are, uh, you know, and in my background, you start from uh, a model early on. The study is what it is, is the situation we, we find ourselves in. Um, but, uh, you know, to say that, that there was no model done, it's, they had no model themselves. Um, but as I mentioned, they had a starting point of of a heat and material balance that uh, you know set those initial recipe values that we looked at how we deviated from, but yeah, ideally, um, a model is uh, would would be preferred to to come first, obviously. Yes, that seems like it would simplify things. Yeah. Okay. So, does Floor typically model unique systems like this? 
and what information would be required to get started? Yeah, I mean, um, with with the uh, the expertise and so forth, and the the subject matter experts and the um, and you know the good engineers, we have tackled a lot of uh, unique problems. I myself have. This isn't the only kind of uh, you know unique study that I've done uh, that was branching out from my my typical experience. Um, and so when uh, someone comes with with a with a problem, you know, getting the right people involved and uh, working through what's required, and uh, we can usually address whatever kind of scope of work that, that that's come up. You know, in my experience, that's what we yeah we've been able to tackle some some unique problems. And, you know, when we take something out of our wheelhouse, that is, you know, a starting point is obviously to get familiar with the system, figure out what's the right way to address the issue, what's the right way to model the, the, the process and, um, and what kind of uh, data we need to start from. If you look at this one, for instance, we had atypical components that we had to characterize. Um, we had a a process that we had to develop an empirical model for and you know so that's an approach that that uh definitely can be adapted to to different problems okay thank you and like one last question here so does it matter what type of oil you use um yeah yeah it matters uh so for it most most chip products what they are or or fried products i should say what oil they are they are fried with is is part of their 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 flavor their texture and so forth and um so if it's sunflower oil or or vegetable oil um you know that that goes into the the cooking part you know when you cook dinner and you whether you're using avocado oil or olive oil, um, that's a the chef's choice. But I mean, if you look at most uh, potato chips, at least sunflower oil is the is the typical oil medium. All right, Michael. Well, thank you for answering all those questions for us. It looks like we uh, we that's all the time for questions we have for now. So I would like to thank Michael and the rest of the innovation pit crew for the time they spent preparing this webinar. And so coming up next, uh, we will be hosting our next webinar on Thursday, September 17th at 10 a.m. Central Time. And in this webinar, Floor Fellow Harry Ha will walk us through the case studies demonstrating when and where it's best to use dynamic process simulation methods. So keep in touch with your floor contacts, follow our social media postings, and head to the Innovation Builders page on floor.com to sign up for future webinars. We really appreciate your attendance today. It's been a pleasure being your moderator, and we will send out a compiled list of the Q&As within a few days. So please head to floor.com midweek next week to hear the recording of the webinar. And if you have any questions or require additional information, please email innovation.builders at floor.com and someone from our team will get back to you. Have a safe day. Thank you.